Excellent. So this is our unit four webinar on chemical bonding. And I am hosting you tonight, Christy Miller. Um, and there's the URL for our slide deck. We have jumped ahead a little bit here. We've talked about payment and where to find the folders. Um, and right now we're working on this idea capture tool, which is asking, um, why, uh, what drew you here today? So a lot of folks talked about they're either just getting ready to start this unit and they want to get kind of a, a glimpse and a vision of what it entails. But also I'm I, like specifically looking at this one. I'm, I'm here because I wanna see what my biology students have been exposed to, like what they should know coming in. I, I love that, welcome. Um, this is my third year teaching the patterns chemistry. Um, and so just, just here to kind of see the big picture. I love that. Um, engineering opportunities, this unit is full of them. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then what do you hope to learn? Seeing some sequencing, some new ideas, um, just kind of resources, some ways of doing this, which is exactly what the webinars are for, right? So you're in the right spot. Um, and then remember, as questions come up as we go through the webinar, feel free to just add them here in our parking lot and we'll come back towards the end of the webinar and we'll look at these questions again. Excuse me, make sure we've addressed them. Okay, let's get back here. Okay, so all of our courses and all of our units, we're always trying to center them around the design principles. Um, and in the design principles, this is where sort of the heart of patterns lies in our approaches to um, inquiry and to student learning. So it's always student-centered, it's always collaborative. We spend a lot of time really focusing on student talk, student engagement, using academic language to explain what they know or uncover what they don't know. Um, and then this, and I share this with kids all the time. I talk about this is this is the way that we do science, right? We're we're gonna make a wild guess. So we're gonna start with a question that it's likely that we don't know the answer to because we haven't studied it yet, right? Like of course we don't know the answer. So that's why it's called a guess. We're literally guessing on what we think the answer is. Then we go through this process of um, collecting data and analyzing the data to look for patterns. We make sense of those patterns and we share out together what we are seeing, try to reach a consensus on that. And then we go back to our first question and now we don't have to guess, right? Now we have a pattern and evidence to rely on. So now we can take a look at this question again and other uh, questions that we can make predictions about the answers using these patterns that we've uncovered. And we say, um, this is how science works, right? It's it's not a guessing game. It's not how I feel about things or what I think about them. It's I'm using the evidence and I'm using the patterns that I've uncovered in my studies to be able to answer questions and make predictions about future questions. So this, you see this um, visual, this graphic, almost on every lab that we do throughout the whole pattern sequence. We come back to it again and again and again, right? So physics spends a bunch of time on this. And I know when I get kids in chemistry, I know they've been exposed to this. I know that they know what the sequence is. They know how to do it, right? Um, and so the more, I think, consistent folks are in their vertical alignment of their courses, right? Physics and chemistry and bio, then by the time they get to biology, the kids are really dialed in, right? They know about academic discourse. They know about board meetings. They know about the inquiry process. They really know and understand because they've seen it so many times. They've done it themselves so many times. Um, we have for our engineering process. Again, we look at this process um, for every engineering project where we start with a problem. Um, we look at our constraints. What are we limited by? Often cost is one of them or materials. Um, then we make a design and we test our design, collecting some data. Um, then we kind of evaluate it. How, how, what do we think about that? Can it be better? Sometimes we, we um, you know, it's an iterative process. We go back and redesign, readjust, collect some more data. 
and then we communicate about it, making a make a final yeah. determination or evaluation on um, how how well our our design worked. Right. So we look at this again, this process in every one of our um, engineering projects. Um, then looking at five through eight, we are always trying to use the lens of being culturally responsive. So even, you know, sometimes our, sometimes the, the theme of a lab or the big question, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate, um, in everyone's, um, area where they live. For example, we've got some feedback that like, these phenomena or these questions seem very Portland centric, right? And that just doesn't ring true to my rural kids in Eastern Oregon. And that's where the teacher agency comes in because you can really change that phenomenon um, or that question or that problem setting into something that is really relevant for your area. And one of the things that we're working on in, um, in all of the councils is trying to come up with some alternate storylines um, as options, right? So sometimes it's not always immediate, what is another option I could use? And I don't have time to think of another option and develop another option. So that's where we're trying to come up with some, um, some suggestions. And so that's a work in progress, just so you know. Um, also working on differentiating language rich, um, again, with the academic discourse, um, and helping students really be able to engage um, and talk about evidence in a meaningful way. Um, that's a constant theme that runs through all three courses. And as is number eight, a three-dimensional assessment. We'll look at our assessment for this unit um, as we get closer to the end. But um, being able to try to evaluate students on not only the DCIs, but also their practices, cross-cutting concepts, um, just coming at it from kind of all perspectives. So um, again, these are the lenses that we, we try to use when we're developing our storylines and our, our unit plans. Um, always a work in progress. Link to the slides right there. there we go. Okay. So unit four planner. So we have um, a, the distance learning unit planners are still all on the PDX STEM website. Um, they The order of them has changed. Previously, they were at the top. And I think now the in-person planners are at the top and the distance learning is at the bottom. Um, but we wanted you to know that they are all still there. So uh, if you had something from CDL that you just love, love, loved, or if you have a um, student that's been absent for a long time or is chronically absent, um, the packets, the unit packets might be useful to you and, and those are on the distance learning planners. So let's look at the in-person planner. So here it is right here. Let's zoom in a little bit so we can see that a little bit better. So up at the top, just like with all of our other unit planners, we have resources up here. So um, we have the unit tracker, um, which really tracks all of these questions that we have, not only the task set questions, but also the unit essential question. Um, so that's a nice thing to have. It's also folded in on the interactive notebook. So that's the INB. Um, and then we have something called a walkthrough, which I'm going to look at in just a second. I have our vocabulary terms. There's that paper packet. We have some notes about just whiteboard meetings in general. Um, we have some CER uh, resource notes, uh, sentence frames, things like that. We have rubrics here for unit four. Those are brand new. We just finished those up last week. And then um, posters and some other useful slides um, for classroom setups. This often has like the patterns slides in them. So you could blow them up and make them big or each kid could have their own copy in their binder, however you want to do it. Lots of good things in there. All right, so really what we're looking at in unit four is we're trying to figure out why do substances behave the way that they do, right? And why are some substances used for particular jobs and other su substances aren't? So we're trying to make that connection between their function and the molecular structure itself, right? Is there a relationship between those? So if I look at the unit walkthrough, 
So here it is right here. So you can see kind of in an overview, this is where we're headed, right? We're looking at structures of molecules and how, how does that determine what their properties are, what they're used for. So we start with our unit opener and then we go into intramolecular forces. So we're looking at the forces between the atoms in a molecule. We spend some time on covalent and ionic. So um, figuring out how to put structures together. Um, then we dive into a specific property, smells, and we look at a relationship between a property of smell and the structure of molecules. Then we look at the interaction between molecules, intermolecular, and then we go to our engineering project. So this is kind of the chain of events for, for unit four. And then the walkthrough literally in its name walks you through briefly each of the task sets and kind of what is the what is the purpose of that task set so what should students know coming in and what should what knowledge should they leave with when they're done with that task set so what students will be doing what we want them to learn here are the notes teacher notes are all restricted files so remember um, to fill out that Google form if you don't have access to the restricted folder, then you'd be able to see all of those teacher notes. Um, what students should know now, so coming into this test set, what they should be able to know and do, what they'll be doing, what we want them to learn. So this is kind of a brief, you know, like, I just need to get a, a big picture vision of what's happening in unit four, kind of where we're starting and where we're stopping, what, what sort of uh, things I can expect students to be able to do. Um, this is your go-to, right? If you just want to like a quick look at the big picture. Okay. All right. So back here on the way, on the unit plan. So that's the walkthrough. And each of our units has a walkthrough like that. Just again, a quick um, overview. Um, then we go down here and then you'll notice it's broken out by task set. So task set one, um, we're making an approximation here. You see it's a wide approximation. So, I mean, 25 or double it, 50 minutes. It kind of depends on how much time you want to put into the unit opener. And that's flexible, right? That's kind of up to the teacher. Um, when you start here, um, in task set one, and we'll get to more details about this, but um, before you jump into the unit opener, you'll want to decide ahead of time which engineering which engineering project do, do I want to do with my students? And then you'll choose the opener that goes with that engineering project. And again, we'll get into that more as we go, but you'll see they're broken out by task set. So task set two, task set three, four, five. Uh, here's the engineering project. And then here's the, the uh, unit test at the end. So sometimes folks like to do the unit test before the engineering project, whatever works for you. You know, there's nothing magical about that particular um, arrangement for six and seven. Seven could come before six. All right, so that's kind of an overview of the unit plan. We have some practice and extension things in here. You'll also, when you go in the teacher notes, you'll also notice that we have often put in their additional resources or um, ways to differentiate or the student finished super early, what can they do now? Some suggestions for that. Um, often those are located in the teacher notes. Um, you'll see the, um, the NGSS dimensions here, um, science and engineering practices, et cetera, et cetera. So we put those in our teacher notes also, and we're making a more intentional, we're trying to make a more intentional connection between those and what the kids are actually doing, right? So how is it that this activity is reinforcing asking questions, right? Trying to make that clearer as we go. And then how do I know if students have learned or not? excuse me, I can always look at this evidence um, statement over here. So um, not as much maybe learning in test set one, right? Because we're just getting started. But as we go down, we can see what students should be able to do. And again, this is um, also discussed in the unit walkthrough. All right, questions so far about the unit plan, just in general. Keeping my eye on the chat box there. Nothing yet. Okay. 
Sounds good. Let's keep going. Um, all right. So again, um, we kind of looked at this already with our um, roadmap from the unit overview, but it just kind of gives us a vision like we're starting with our opener. We're looking at, at the interaction between atoms. We work on putting those structures together. We look at intensively at a specific property. Then we look at the interaction between molecules. And then we're ready, really. We've done all the pieces. We're ready now to, to engage in our engineering project. So that's kind of the, the sequence of events there, sequence of topics. All right, so in task set one, really our big question, why do different materials have different properties? So we're going to select a slideshow that supports the engineering project that you want to do. And unit four has more engineering projects than any other unit. I mean, this, this unit topic is just ripe for so many different things that you can do. And I've done all of them, and they're all excellent. Um, but... Um, and, and I'll share them with you, with you here in a second. So we have shampoo engineering, candy engineering, stain remover engineering, lip balm or chapstick, soap, and salad dressing. So salad dressing is what we develop during CDL. So this is a this is an engineering project that students can do 100% at home with um, some materials that they likely already have in their cabinet. We just need an oil, we need a vinegar, and then there's some emulsifiers that they can choose from, like a mustard, et cetera. Um, so uh, this is one, this is great for absent students or um, if a student is doing a fair amount of online learning for whatever reason, this is, this is a great one. You can do it in class too, absolutely. Um, soap engineering is probably the one I did the longest ago. Sometimes folks don't like the soap engineering because you have to use a pretty strong base in your um, recipe. And then that's, you know, safety concerns um, start to bubble up. So um, when I did this with my students, I had that material in the hood, and then I was in charge of doing the pouring. And then once it was poured, they could take the beaker and mix it and go to their station. So just some more kind of safety things you have to consider. The probably the one I've done the most is the chapstick engineering or the lip balm. Um, we're trying to transition it to lip balm because chapstick is a trademark name. Um, Lip balm is, um, it's, I like this one especially because it's very flexible. You can make it longer or you can make it shorter, just kind of depending on what you have time to do. So often I've used this one as like an end of the semester lab practical in a way, right? We've done all this lab work all semester. Now um, this is our lab practical or our lab final. Um, and so, um, it's very adjustable according to um, a schedule that you can do. Um, a lot of folks really like the stain remover. Um, it's, I mean, all of these feel very relatable to me in terms of what kids are familiar with, right? Um, stain remover, especially because we spill something on our clothes, we want to get it out of our clothes. Like, how does that work? How does the stain remover even work? Um, so that's a fun one. Um, it's got very visual testing, um, as does the the chapstick or the lip balm. Have very visual testing. Um, candy engineering is one that I did um, relatively recently. This one requires a lot of. Oops, sorry a lot of really specific supplies. So you have to have food safe glassware. Um, you have to have kind of a food safe area or setup. It takes a while, it took us several days. I will tell you the kids were super duper engaged. They were really into this one because uh, you get to eat it too. You know, it's fun. Everything about it is fun. Um, so we did that one most recently, and then it's been a few years since I did shampoo engineering, but again, the kids really resonated with this one. I just went to Safeway and got five or six um, um, shampoo brands that 
you see commercials for and they were very recognizable I'll put it that way and um so the kids really like kind of exploring that and comparing those um so that that was also a fun one to do so anyway you choose which engineering project you want to do think about your time think about your resources think about your materials that you have um and kind of read through them a little bit look at kind of the um uh not pitfalls but like things to watch out for that kids might um deviate on or or not understand you know like what what's in your bandwidth to be able to support um and then from there as you're going through the unit uh opener slides really the purpose here is for for you to get the kids engaged in and talking about what really the question is like why why do some materials why are some materials used for certain jobs and other materials aren't right so let's see what i've got here so creating an experience meaning um when i do the unit opener like for example with candy that was the last one i did i went out and did a little bit of candy shopping and i bought uh, so i had three sections for this class so i bought enough for each kid to have a piece of each kind of candy uh, is a little math you know I had to do a little calculating there to figure out how many bags to get but then I would take a, like a Dixie cup and I'd put um, a few of each kind and then I would take that to the table and then the kids were really kind of investigating the different kinds of candy thinking about its texture thinking about how tart it was thinking about how squishy um kind of what's the consistency um, and then they had the structures of the components of each of the candies so then they could try to start to make a relationship between oh well this this candy has all of these molecules that have this this funny shaped structure like they're all kind of the same they don't know anything about structure at that point right they're just visually trying to make a connection and really what that's doing is it's getting us to a place where students can start to write questions they're starting to wonder about why they're seeing what they're seeing why is this why is this candy really firm but this one's really squishy or this one's kind of grainy but this one's really smooth like why is that what, what about those components make it that way? So we're giving students post-it notes and students are writing down some questions. And then you can go a couple of different ways here. I, I really love a driving question board because um, just really uh, asking kids to, to wonder and be curious about what they're, what they're touching, what they're experiencing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think this is Christy Miller's opinion right now. I don't think we do that enough in our worlds. Wonder, wonder about what's going on. Um, and so um, this is a really nice opportunity for kids to really kind of wonder in, in a safe space. Like we're, we're not taking big risks here. There's no grade attached to this. We're just kind of sharing and wondering out loud. And then um you can either um, have the students share at a table, like share what their questions are with each other, and then pick two of your favorites. And those are the two that we're going to put up on the driving question board. Or you can have each student do their own um, question. Uh, the point is that we want to have them read it aloud, ideally make a connection to the previous question that was just read. Um, and think about where they're going to put it on the board, right? Um, there are some example uh, questions. I believe this, these are questions from unit three, but you can see types of questions that are there. What we really don't want students to do is to write yes, no questions. And we don't want them to write questions where we can quickly Google the answer, right? We want them to be bigger, broader questions, more about how ideas are connected rather than simple kind of fact-based questions. Ideally, if you're starting 
this at unit one and you're working through a DQB at each unit, by the time you get to unit four, they're going to have a pretty dialed in. Like they're going to know what you're looking for. You've modeled it. You've shown examples of, of good questions and, and not good questions. Um, you've talked about it a bunch. So there's, you know, it's it's a heavier lift in the beginning of the year because there's a little bit more training involved. But by the time we get to unit four, they should be pretty confident about writing questions, or we hope that they're more confident about writing questions. Um, Lorena, I see you have a question or a comment in the chat. If your school is doing IB bio, I do recommend the SOAP lab, the SOAP engineering. Can you say more about that? Why do you recommend that? So yes, so um, so this is my first year teaching IB Bio and uh, the first unit and and they just changed uh, the the curriculum not well not the curriculum but it's uh, uh it's the the roadmap um and uh, and the first the first um <clears throat> well unit was uh water and properties of water and then and then uh. And then we did the DNA extraction when we started to do uh, uh, DNA and 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 nucleic acids. So so yeah, we have to extract DNA using uh, well breaking down the 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 cell membranes, and we're using soap. Yeah. So yeah, and then and then <clears throat> they need to be able to understand why we are using soap. So yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, direct some direct connections there between the soap engineering and then the very beginning of IB Bio. It, it'll be a few months before they do that very beginning lab, but there's still a connection there. And the um the IB Bio teacher can reference, like, hey, do you remember when you guys did soap in chemistry? Tell me about some of the properties of soap. You know, you could you could pull that in. So that's a great um connection. Thanks for Thanks for um, including that, Lorena. All right, so driving question board, then we can group them. So here's some pictures of driving question boards from my classroom. These are from unit one. I can tell because I've got mountainous region, I've got a water, a hydrosphere, I've got an atmosphere, et cetera, right? I've got the different spheres that we focus on in unit one. And then I ask students to place their sticky on the sphere that it most related to. So this was my attempt to bring, to do some grouping and for them to start thinking about, well, is my question really about the hydrosphere or is it really about gases and the atmosphere? What's it about, right? So attempting for us to kind of make that connection. This is um, the driving question board with no stickies on it. This is a driving question board for candy. So why? Why do different materials have different properties? And then I've got all these structures here. Again, they have no idea what this means, right? We haven't studied it at all. All they know is I've heard of cornstarch. Like I know I know what sucrose is, right? Of citric acid. I feel like I've heard of that. I don't totally know what that is. But what I told them is just look at how things are connected. Look at who's connected to who. And these different shapes, like this one is kind of a table and then... This one is just kind of a line, like that's interesting, right? Just kind of, oh, there's a bunch of circles on this one, right? That's kind of our level of noticing right now. And then as we gain more knowledge, as we go through the unit, we, we constantly come back and revisit the driving question board and think about what do we know now? What are we able to answer now? And how can I, maybe I need to even reframe that question because now I understand what these pictures mean. Right, so I might write a follow-up question, or I might, I might take my original question, which I can make clearer now because I have more knowledge, and I might, I might add one to it. I might add like a little sub-question to that. So some things to think about. All right, so for test set one, remember our whole purpose is just to be introduced to ultimately to the engineering project that we are studying and then to to do some wondering and thinking about it trying to look for some connections i don't really have a lot of knowledge right now but i'm going to i'm going to try to look for some connections and ultimately i'm trying to figure out 
why, what's the purpose of some ingredients? Why do, you know, it's even, even more confounding sometimes is not, two candies have a lot of similar ingredients, but their consistency is really different. Like what's going on with that, right? These are kind of the things that we want students to wonder and be thinking about. So all about asking questions in unit one. Um, all right, so then we get into task set two, which is looking at the interaction between atoms in a molecule. So intramolecular. So we talk all about intra and inter and what do those prefixes mean? And I say, remember from ninth grade, your language arts teachers thinking about you right now as you're as you're talking about prefixes, because that's at our school, that's when they do a lot of um, prefix work. Um, so we we talk about other words that start with intra and inter and, and try to deduce the meaning that way. Um, and then we have two, this is a great lab. I really love this lab. We have two versions of it. One is a longer version. And um, I often do the shorter, more visual version. They're doing the same thing, which is testing a group of materials and looking for patterns in the results of the testing, just like every other inquiry based um, uh, lab investigation that we do, right? So they're doing the exact same thing. One's just a little bit more visual than the other. So when I click on that one, it takes me here. Okay, so my wild guess um, that I start with is Truvia. So they have some, some inkling of what Truvia is. Um, I say, I just got this off the shelf at Safeway. Uh, you know, what, what do you use it for? Oh, it's a low calorie sweetener. Okay, great. Well, here's some questions that we have about it. Is Does it dissolve in water? Does it conduct electricity? And, and does it melt? And they're like, I don't know. Yeah, hence, it's a wild guess, right? We're literally guessing here. Think about your, your previous life experience, maybe using um, sweeteners and putting it in your drink. Think about that. Does it dissolve in water? Use that as your kind of your gauge to be able to answer these. So they go through and they make some wild guesses. And then we're looking at, can we make predictions of a substance's properties based on the connections that it has in the molecule? That's what we're getting at. So um, there are, you can see on the slides when you go through the slides for this lab, there are many choices for substances. My number one recommendation to you is that you pre-select a handful of substances that are going to kind of hit all the bases, right? And I encourage you to test them first because we have a couple that um, that seem to be that seem to give results that are kind of in the middle. Right. And then you don't want to get caught in the uh, we're looking at results and we're trying to come up with patterns and like, hmm, why is that one kind of between these two? Right. So test them out first. That was my number one takeaway after I did the lab was like, all right, some of these I probably should have tested ahead of time. But we have just some straight metals in here. We have some just straight non-metal substances, right? So we can make some pretty good predictions about that. It's really like the citric acid in there, the weak acid that gives us kind of results in between. Um, so give those a try. I have the students make a prediction. Do you think it's going to conduct just what you know about it? And I have them in class. I hold them up like here's the bottle of salt substitute. Right. I might have this. We talk about well, why would I use a salt substitute? Why don't I just use salt? Right. We kind of talk about that a little bit. Oh, it's got K in it instead of N.A. Oh, that's interesting. Right. We can talk about that a little bit. We have just some straight metals. Again, I'm holding them up. They're making a prediction. So is it going to conduct and is it going to dissolve? Right. Yes or no. That's all they're doing. And then we have. Um, Station set, uh, set up where we have a little um, conductivity, um, a little conductivity probe to see if it's conducting. And then we're just putting some into a beaker of water. Is it dissolving? Uh, and then dissolve and then conduct. So once it dissolves, and this is a yes, does it conduct? So this is does it conduct in its natural form, like just off the shelf? Does it conduct just in its natural form? And this is, does it conduct after it dissolves? 
Um, and then for melting time, I'm just taking like a tiny amount at the end of my scupula and I'm putting that in the Bunsen burner and I'm, I'm waiting up to 30 seconds to see if it liquefies. So that's kind of my cutoff. It happened before 30 seconds or it took longer than 30 seconds. I guess it could equal exactly 30 seconds. So that's kind of my gauge, right? Um, so then we've got... So I've got slides two and three here is my list of things. So students are off collecting data and then they're going through and they're trying to group the materials based on the results. So these are the substances that dissolved and conducted. These are the which substances conduct electricity but do not dissolve in water. So these would be our straight metals, right? Like our chunk of copper and our chunk of aluminum, et cetera. That's what we would see here. And then now find all the substances that dissolve in water and divide them into two categories. These dissolve and conduct, and these do dissolve but don't conduct. And then what do the substances that dissolve and conduct have in common? So look at the formulas. Again, we're trying to see some patterns here. And then they dissolve but don't conduct. What do they have in common? Um, how are you testing conductivity? We use um, a vernier conductivity probe um, that um, just to see if we can get some conductance through it. And um, this is where testing the materials ahead of time comes in handy because you'll get some that have a value of like 300, right? Like it definitely conducts. And then you'll get some that have zero and then you'll get some that have 30. Like, hmm, what's happening with the 30? And that's kind of that citric acid. It's like a weak acid. So I do have some ionization there. So I do register like a little bit of a current, but it's not 300, right? So we kind of talk about that a little bit. So what I ended up telling my students is we got to have double digits. If we have double digits, that's a yes. We're going to call that a yes, right? So decide where is your cutoff, right? Um, during CDL, um, we did this part um, like I did this and they watched me. So I would take and I just used a, a multimeter. And so I'd take the um, the ends of the multimeter and I, and I just stick it into the bag of baking soda. And then we'd look at the screen. Is that conducting? There should be a value there. Nope, not conducting. Um, oh, we hold it to the piece of aluminum. Oh, now we're seeing something. Right, so you can do it that way too. You can use a multimeter um, just to, to see if you get, if you can register a value. Um, I had some folks try it. They made a very simple circuit with a little Christmas light um, and a nine volt battery. So you could, you could do that. You could put those little ends in um, or touch the metal or um, that, that sometimes works. Um, when you're when you're trying to do it in a beaker and you have material dissolved in the water, theoretically it should work, but you have to add enough material to get enough ions in there to conduct the current. So again, that's a great piece to work through ahead of time just to make sure that you know how much you have to add or have them kind of pre-made up and off to the side like, okay, let's test the salt substitute now. Right, so you've already pre-added enough and you know it works. Valerie. Hi, sorry, I was just wondering, um, I didn't quite catch all of the materials for the materials that you're testing, but you did mention you have acetic acid, I think, is that one of them? Um, if I'm not familiar with all of these things, like, um, cal like um, all of the materials, do you put in the notes like um, what precautions we should be taking with some of them or if we need to be taking extra precautions with others or how to dispose of the materials when we're done with them? Do you guys include that information? Yeah, great question. They are all um, things that we would find in the kitchen. We, we tried to keep, I mean, except for like maybe a, a chunk of copper. You might not have a chunk of copper. You might, might have it on the bottom of a pan. But um, we tried to keep these as all things that we would find in our kitchen so that we didn't have a lot of issues with um, waste or things like that because these are in small enough amounts. We could put them in the garbage and and that would be fine way to dispose of them. Um, the one that I 
I really had to look for was this meat tenderizer right here. I'm pretty sure I never used that in my kitchen. So um, I, I had to do some searching for that to find that on the shelf uh, at the grocery store. But again, on the on the longer version, let's just take a look here really quick. There's There are a bunch of things here that you can choose from and feel free to choose things that are not on this list. I would just, again, work through them ahead of time so you you know how to anticipate what their results are gonna be and, and are they fitting in with the, the pattern of the like materials. Um, but yeah, there's lots of things to choose from here. Um, yeah, here's that conductivity probe that I was talking about, and it links right into the Chromebook, so it's super easy setup. Uh, here's a bunch of things as well, um, et cetera. So same, again, same exploration that we're doing. This is just a little bit longer version. All right, so then we're grouping. We're noticing some patterns. And what did not conduct? Um, what patterns did you notice about the things that did not conduct? And then here we're moving into using those patterns to make an evidence-based um, prediction about rubbing alcohol. Now we didn't try that one at all, right? But based on what we see here and based on the patterns that we already established, how would we expect this to behave? Would it dissolve in water? Would it conduct? And would it melt? Then we come back and revisit Truvia. So here it is again. We're not gonna we're not gonna guess now because we actually have some some evidence that we can pull from to make a better prediction. So here's the, again here's the molecule. Look at the pattern. What would we expect to see? Um, then we do um, a little bit of work on metals and nonmetals. So um, again, we've seen. We've seen this in um, unit two. We did a whole bunch of work with the periodic table, right? So we know our metals and our nonmetals, but now we're introducing, and we've talked about electronegativity um, also in that unit, but now we're looking at, hmm, I have K and CL. So K is way over here and CL is way over here. And I know how KCL behaves. I know it has a really high melting point and it does dissolve in water and it does conduct. So I wonder if there's a relationship here between the electronegativity values and the way it's behaving, right? So we're kind of adding another layer now to it. And then finally, for our final, like putting it all together, we have a dichotomous key here where we're starting with the first question of does the substance dissolve in water? Yes or no? That's our first big question. And then if it does dissolve, then does it conduct after it dissolves? So yes, if it does conduct, then those are the things I'm putting here, the name and the formula. And if it doesn't conduct, it's dissolved, but it doesn't conduct, those are the items I put here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that on both sides for yes and no, does it dissolve in water? And then again, I'm, I should be seeing some patterns here. It's really just putting in a dichotomous key what I already came to on this slide, right? We're just sort of reorganizing it. Now the piece that we're adding in is okay. Now that we've done this, now that we've seen the patterns, now what kind of bonding is it? And why is it that kind of bonding? So before we can answer this, we do need to have a lesson on ionic and covalent and what that means. Um, and then once we have that lesson, then they can kind of come back here and look at the patterns and figure out, um, is it ionic? Is it covalent? Um, and then uh, make a connection between ionic and its properties and covalent and its properties. And you'll notice, uh, and the other one is metallic. We don't spend a lot of time talking about metallic, just rather that it's kind of a connection between metals um, and that in advanced chemistry, we'll spend more time digging into metallic. So that's sort of the extent that we talk about it. Now, you might be wondering, why are there four things down here when there's really only three kinds of bonding that we focus on? So one of them um, is covalent, and it does not dissolve in water. 
and one of them is covalent and it does dissolve in water. So then we're trying to figure out, well, why is that? Why do some covalents like sugar dissolve in water? They don't conduct, but they dissolve. But then like um, paraffin wax, it's the same kind of atoms. They're all non-metals, but they don't dissolve. So then we start looking at, okay, well, maybe there's another layer to the pattern, right? And so then what we really get into is the size of the molecule, right? So these guys are much smaller molecules, and these ones are much larger. So the size apparently has a has a role to play in this as well. And that's that's kind of where we leave it at that time. And then we continue on in our unit investigating. Um, this is a great lab. I really enjoy this one because kids are making very concrete connections between the way it behaves and the type of atoms that are in it. Right. So that's kind of the whole takeaway of this one. OK, so oops, let's go back there. OK, so the takeaways here is that we have we have compounds that are made up of metals and nonmetals. And those are ionic and they tend to have a high melting point. They tend to dissolve in water and then they tend to conduct once they're dissolved. Um, compound. So the way I know that it has a high melting point is it is not liquefied after 30 seconds. It is still in its solid form. And so I know I can get the Bunsen burner any hotter than that. So then we just call that a high melting point. We don't know what it is, but we just call it a high melting point. Compounds made of all nonmetals, those are liquefying within 30 seconds. So they have a low melting point. Um, sometimes they dissolve in water, sometimes they don't. Remember we talked about that depends on the size, but regardless, they never conduct. And then large and small nonmetal compounds behave differently with solubility. Some dissolve and some don't. The bigger it is, the less likely it is to dissolve. So those are kind of our, our takeaways for test set two. How are we doing so far? Questions? All right. Raised hand, Valerie, go ahead. Hi, this is kind of a dumb question, but so um, in the past I've done something like this and when you're trying to determine if the substance will uh, melt or not, quickly I've had students like hold it over the flame for too long and they've done it in um, beakers over a bunch of burner and they've not beakers sorry test tubes and they obviously uh, cracked the test tube so um, just technical wise technically wise like how do you pump? you just put it in a scoopula and then how do you keep it from catching on fire if you're just putting it in a scoopula yes. if it's yeah it's powder yep great question <clears throat> so um uh, I just put a little, you just need a tiny, tiny bit at the end of the scupula. And then I, um, I put the scupula over the flame. So trying not to get any of the material in the flame, right? Because then we potentially might see some fun colors and see some other stuff. And that's going to take us off track. So trying to keep the, the flame touching just the bottom of the scupula. You can also just put it, so if this is the flame, you can just put it in on the side. Um, and again, I say just just for 30 seconds and if nothing happens, you're done. Like you can stand there all day and it's not going to melt. Um, uh, sometimes if it's, you know, it's decomposing instead, it's changing color, it's turning black. I just talk about, we're trying not to let the flame touch the material. So just let it touch the scupula and that's all. Um, and I, I find I have to model it a couple of times for them, or if they're struggling, like mine's not doing anything, you know, I'll come over and I'll watch them while they do it and give them some suggestions. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Some ideas anyway. Yeah, yeah, it does. thank you. Perfect, of course. Great. I just oh, go ahead. Better. Yeah, yeah, we've done it with um, like hot plates and tin foil too. Like if you just make a little boat out of foil and put it on hot plates, as long as you tell them not to turn the hot plate up too high because it gets really, 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 really hot. Um, so yeah. that, that works pretty well too. And then they're less likely to catch it on fire. Um, uh, Christy, I had a question about, uh, you were talking about when they're categorizing things and, and putting them in the dichotomous key that you yeah. do like a, a lesson on like ionic versus covalent bonds and introduce yeah. those ideas. 
I'm having a hard time finding those slides anywhere. And there's a spot on the teacher, the, da, 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 which one is it? Oh, the unit four outline that says like student version of slides, but that mm -hmm. just takes me to like a PDF of the slides. And I guess I'm wondering like, are there things somewhere like, yeah, it's down under task set two, that thing right there that says student version of slides. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's just opening up a PDF, which is, I mean, is it doing that for you too? Yeah, it is. It's just, uh, let's, Instead yep, of like taking me to a Google drive and I can't find it anywhere. I guess I'm just wondering, like gotcha. we have something that's like the, the slides for how to like go through difference between covalent and ionic stuff. Like, is that already done somewhere or was that something that, um, that I'm, I'm just not finding it. Yeah. Great question. So, um, when I'm thinking back to the slides, I don't think there are any particular parts lesson wise, um, but we do have, this is a, there's a great simulation in there um, where that you can use to kind of talk about the difference between ionic and covalent. Um, but that's a good, I'm gonna make a note of that, that maybe we need to add some slides um, for that part of the lesson. Thank you for that feedback. And and then that spot where it just creates the PDF, is that on purpose or is, was there, is, should that link to a Google site? Um, it's, it's down here in my downloads, I'm sure, yeah. but um, it sure. should be, sometimes when we do a student version, I like the student versions because sometimes the slide deck is, I'm not going to get through all of that material in one day and I don't want them to pre-look ahead and see the pattern and stuff. So I might make a, a cropped version of the file, but I don't usually make it a PDF. I usually make it just a URL. So let me um, make that adjustment after the webinar and I'll update that link. Okay, thank you. Pass that too. Absolutely, thanks. Um, student version. Okay. Awesome. Great. All right, let's keep going. Um, boop. Here we are. Okay. So um, in task set three, we have talked about ionic and covalent, of course, so that we could we could do the final part of the dichotomous key, but now we're digging in and looking more specifically at how do we construct those um, molecules or how do we put those structures together? So we have some slides um, for the lesson for that, and then we have some practice. Same thing with ionic. Um, you all know Jamboard is going away, right? So oh, this one's still here. So this Jamboard, we're going to have to um, replace it with another medium. But I really like this one because you can move these cards around and you can say like, oh, I wonder if this would pair with this one. And it's a great opportunity like, oh, nope, they're both negative. That's not going to happen. OK, how about with this one? Oh, it's a plus one and a minus one. So that's going to balance out. So I really like the dragging nature of this that they can do. Um, and then I have them go into groups and say, OK, I want you to make a compound between AL and S. And we're going to draw some Bohr models. And I want you to show me what forms. Right. So we're doing ionic as well as covalent. So why is it AL2S3? Like, I, I didn't just make up those little numbers. Like, where did they come from? So we bring it all the way back to the Bohr model and those valence electrons and talk about everybody needs a complete shell. Oh, how are they going to do that? They're going to give them away or take them. Versus in covalent, we're sharing, right? So d literally drawing that out so that we have a visual of what that looks like. And you can see there's a bunch of examples. So group two is doing some shuffling and then they're doing K and O. Well, what structure is going to form between K and O, et cetera. Group three is doing some shuffling, and then they're going to do S, R, and N, et cetera. So that's why there's so many cards here. So you can break them up into groups. Um, okay, so we have, so those are the cards that are being referenced on the Jamboard. We have some practice naming and writing those compounds. Here's that bonding simulation. Um, if you haven't had a chance to go to AACT and look at some of their free simulations, they have some great stuff on there. Um, not all of it is free, of course. Um, they have some great stuff that's not free. And so if you're looking to have a membership at a professional organization, AACT has some lovely, lovely things I've used many, many times. Um, so just a suggestion. 
All right. Then uh, our, our takeaways here, of course, is that we're trying to figure out, um, you know, when these when these atoms go together to make a molecule, how are they how are they connecting with each other? Are they sharing electrons or are they giving electrons away? Are they gaining electrons or how does that work? Right. So, again, we saw some patterns early on when we have a metal. It's usually with a nonmetal. And then we have these other molecules over here and they're all nonmetals. And these all these nonmetals are connected by sharing. And these metals and nonmetals are connected by exchanging right? Giving away and taking. Um, and not only that, but sometimes they're more complex in that they have, they share more than one pair of electrons. Sometimes they share two pairs or three pairs. And then how do we name those? What do we call them when we see them? So this lesson takes a couple of days to, there's a lot here, right, to, to go over. Um, so this, yeah, this one takes a couple of days. All right. This lab is fabulous. I love this lab. It's one of my favorites. Um, we're focusing on one particular property. Remember in uh, uh, intra, we looked at three things. Does it conduct? Does it dissolve? And does it melt? Right? So now we're just looking at, does it smell? How does it smell? So again, same sequence here. We're, we're, um, we're starting off with a guess but then we're looking for patterns in the things that we smell, okay? So um, we have, we start off with five vials to begin with, and we know the name of them and we know their formula. And then we're, we're recording what is the smell, and then we're trying to see some patterns between the name, the formula, and the smell. So that's kind of our goal here. Now, this one's super fun because, um, you know, you got to have your token gross one in there, right? You got to have your token gross smell. That's the butyric acid. Um, stinky, right? And then they just, oh, my gosh, it smells so bad. It's, you know, it's big fun. Um, then we have our smells that we can easily identify. We have our banana in there. We have our coconut smell, our orange, things like that, things that we can identify. Um, and so we we try to keep this reined in at the beginning, and we, we just have them categorize it into three different categories. It's either sweet, it's... Um, I'm going to tax my memory here. Sweet, fishy. the other one hang on okay we'll, we'll get to that in just a second but we're, again our we're starting with our wild guess which is ethyl acetate and they're like what's that again we're guessing right we don't know if we have no idea what this is we're just gonna we're gonna take a wild guess so we start with these and then we move on to these compounds right here um, well, that's just going to bug me. So I'm going to go to the actual thing and take a look. Here it is. So here's the slides. This is what it should have popped up um, on the previous student slides, right? It should just be a URL that's in presentation mode. Uh, so we talk a little bit about how the olfactory system works in our nose. Again, just really, really general, very basic. And then we look at um, we look at molecular formulas. We look at structural formulas. Ultimately, we look at isomers. Okay, here it is. Uh, wild guess is ethyl acetate. There's our inquiry pattern again. We're taking a wild guess and writing a question. There we go. Fishy, minty. That's the one I forgot. It's either fishy, it's minty, or sweet. So for the first round of smells, you know, you could imagine that students are kind of going all over the place. Oh, look, Pam wrote it in there. Thank you so much, Pam. I just didn't see it. Minty. Um, they could be putting all kinds of things here. So we try to keep them reined in. One of these three, that's what you get to use, one of these three. So we talk about how to waft, how to do proper smelling. And then here, here's those first five, minty, sweet, 
or fishy. That's what you get to pick. And then we go a little further with six, seven, and eight after we look at some patterns. So what did we notice about the smells, the name, and the formula? Did we see any patterns? Make a list of patterns with your table. Um, and then we're going to share out as a class and see if we, um, we arrived at the same patterns. Then we start to notice things like this, right? Oh, well, things that have similar smells have similar endings of their names. So sweet smelling molecules tend to end in eight. Minty is in own and fishy are in ein. Those are the endings, right? So we're kind of collecting all of our patterns that we notice on here. Then we, then we look at our next three. So we have ethyl pentanoate, uh, butyric acid, and ethyl acetate. So remember, this one was our wild guess. So using the same patterns that we just collected here, can you make some predictions about how these are going to smell? So then they go in and they make their predictions. What evidence do you have? All right. And then, um, but they just don't, I mean, they know the name from the previous slide, right? But what smell would you give? And then we start to look at the structure. So they all have O2. So a lot of times what people write is they're all going to be sweet smelling, right? Because that's what my other O2s smelled like. But then after they do the smells, they realize like, oh, this one is definitely not sweet smelling, right? And furthermore, when I look more closely at the structure, I see that this is a carboxylic acid. So I have this C double bond O and it's at the end of the chain, whereas this one has a C double bond O and it's in the middle. And this one is also in the middle. So I'm expecting that these two will probably smell similar and this one does not. So a first filter is, yeah, how many oxygens does it have? If it has two, it's likely to smell sweet. But when we dig a little deeper, we can see that's not always the case. And here's the, the example of that. Um, and then we look, we start looking at isomers. We look at like, gosh, this one looks real similar. Let's see, two of these are the same. I think it's this one, these two right here. These are the same. So we talk about it's just turned. Um, and what, what is an isomer? What does that mean? And I tell them, we're getting a little preview of organic chemistry here. This is like when you go to college, you're going to have a whole year devoted to organic chemistry. And that's where the good stuff is, right? So we're getting a little preview, a little fun. Feel like we're doing some college level organic chemistry work. Um, Honk1234 is referring to a, a particular curriculum that we used to have living by chemistry. Probably should change these slides just to update it. But anyway, um, there's also a go formative here again with honk. So smells lab is great. Really enjoy that lab. Questions? Questions about that one so far? For the yeah, I have a question. Sorry, I have a question. Again, are all of these materials um, quote unquote kitchen safe or do I need to? Um, like, and do, there's a list somewhere of all the materials we should have, but if they're not safe, um, just tips in handling them. Yeah, great question. They are all um, generally safe. Let's see if I can get to, I'm going to close that intra. Uh, la, 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 la. Let's see if I can get to it here. Smells, if I got it here in the teacher notes. Uh, there's the slideshow. Oftentimes we have like a materials list. I'm not seeing that right off the top here. Um, you know, I got all of these except for seven. I got all of these at the grocery store and they're mostly, they are all, um, like essential oils or in the baking aisle, like the coconut and the banana etc. Like if you're making uh, a quick bread and you want an orange flavor, you know, you would buy those little bottles. The butyric acid, I had a heck of a time finding that. So you know what? I, I, che I cheated on that one. 
And I went down to the bio room and I just got some snake poop and I put it in a test tube with some water, shook it up and then um, used a pipette and pulled out the liquid and then put that in my little vial. They didn't know, no idea. It stinks, right? Butyric acid's kind of a poopy, stinky smell. So um, that worked great. And I didn't even need to buy a chemical or worry about disposal. So highly recommend uh, that if you if you don't have butyric acid that's the only one that's that was a little weird and and difficult to find these other ones just you know baking aisle and then garbage when you're done it's such a little bit I mean I bought at the health food store I bought the little tiny they're literally like this big little tiny vials they're meant for essential oils right and then I had three or four drops of these in each of those little vials um it's it's some time to set up for the lab i'll tell you that right now just take some time it's a great ta job if you have tas um the fish oil i just bought a small container of like fish oil supplements and then i poked a hole in the in the little liquid gel thing and I just pipetted out the oil and then I dropped it into my little vial so you know make it easy you can buy fish oil in liquid form I'll raise it's a little bit more expensive but you can buy it in liquid form and then just pipette it into the little vials label the little vials with a with not the name but like a letter and then keep those all set up for you for the next time you do it Right. So all you have to do is roll it off the shelf. It's already made up. It's already labeled. It's already refilled. It's all the things. Um, the initial setup does take some time, though. Uh, this website and the Flynn catalog will show you all safety and disposal information you'll need. Love it. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, all right. Great. Okie doke. So we are here, kind of walk through this already. Takeaways. Eight means sweet, two oxygens. And if they're in the middle, it's sweet. And if they're at the end, it's putrid. Amines are fishy, and there's a nitrogen in the compound. Ones are minty, only one oxygen. These are kind of the, the pattern takeaways we see. We had some new terms here, a molecular formula, a structural formula, and an isomer. Not only do properties depend on what type of elements are in the molecule, but also in how they are connected to each other. Like where, where are those key elements? Are they at the end? Are they in the middle? Is it a nitrogen? Is it an oxygen? You know, things like that. Those are kind of our, our big takeaways. All right. Then we do an intermolecular lab. So now we've we've done all of our digging into the molecules themselves. How are the atoms connected? What's the arrangement of the atoms? Who's connected to who? You know, we've done all of that investigating. So now what we're looking at is the interaction between those molecules, and that's the inter. This lab is a series of um, stations that I have students rotate through. So you'll see my students up here at the top. They are doing the evaporation. So I have, let's see if I can read these. I have water right here, and I bet this one is IPA, isopropyl alcohol. I have them take the cotton ball and dunk it in, take the tongs and like squeeze it and get the liquid all the way through the cotton ball, take it out, shake it off, and then when you're ready, take your two cotton balls and make like a, a runway strip on your um, lab bench. So you take your two cotton balls and with try to do equal pressure and equal distance. And I'm just going to take them and I'm going to run them across the table like that. And I always make it like a big production. Like you got to do the arms up at the end. That's a big deal, right? You just get a better launch when you do that. So. Then you have your two strips, right? And then you're watching really closely. And I tell them, don't be tricked by this one because students are often tricked. Because what happens is, this is the water right here. What happens is this starts to clump right away. So the edges uh, fold in and make like a thicker liquid. And it looks like it's evaporating. So the students go, oh, this one, this one's evaporating the fastest. 
when in actuality, this was the IPA, right? You see the strip, it's almost gone. So I say, wait, like watch the whole thing all the way through and notice, you know, sometimes I get down, get, like, get down, get, get eye level with it. Like this one is thicker, right? It's like all the, the water molecules like bunched up together to give some, some height to that. Whereas this one, it's really thin and look, look where all the rest of it, it's gone, right? So, um, Students are often tricked by this one because they, they try to come to a conclusion too quickly, right? So go slow. Really watch. Get eye level. We do drops on a penny. You know, they did this in middle school. It just never gets old, right? They just love this so much. And it's big competition. How many can you get on the penny? Um, we also do, I try to extend this a little bit and I try to get them to think about like, hey, what do you think are some things that keep us from getting the same results like if we're all doing the same liquid and the same penny why aren't we all getting the same drops and then they start to go oh well it depends on how hard you squeeze the bulb like the drops could be really small or really big so we kind of start thinking about that a little error analysis light you know we're not doing anything with that information but we're just sort of brainstorming it together and trying to be observant curious people like why is that happening uh, we do the balloon with the water, right? So um, developing the charge on the balloon could be like on a, a plastic wand, could be, um, you know, bunny fur or something like that. Developing a charge and then you hold it next to the stream. This one's really impactful when kids see it for the first time. It's like, what just happened? Why is the water moving? Right? So being attracted to the to the charge balloon. I love that one. Um, we also do a little, a little capillary action. So looking to see um, how high up different liquids go, water versus IPA versus mineral oil, for example, right? So we have all of these are different stations, capillary action, um, surface tension, um, evaporation. That's with the landing strips here. Um, and attraction by, and attraction, right? We have some attraction here. Um, and we're designing tests for multiple substances. So trying to use the same three or four substances at the stations around the room, just so that we can, just so that we can start to make connections between those. Um, the, let's see if I have the other one here really quick. Let me go back here for a second. Um, on the intermolecular forces. Let me look at that really quick. Uh, making a wild guess about acetone. Seen that. Here's our substances that we're going to be working with and testing. Um, there's something very specific I'm looking for here. We have our board meeting, our data informed prediction. Um, start looking at molecular polarity, looking at patterns. I don't have it in here, um, and I, I will add it in, but one of my favorite stations. Let's go back there really quick so we can look at the stations. One of my favorite stations is to look at the, um, the, the state of matter at room temperature for um, different groups of compounds. So for example, I have four containers and each of the containers has just non-metal covalent compounds. So in the first one, I have like methane gas. I don't really have methane gas in there, um, but since it's clear and transparent, it, I just think, oh, it's, it's methane gas in this one, CH4. Then I have the molecule, the formula on the front label. And then um, I have, um, I think, mineral oil. And then I have water. And then I have, you know, and as we go across, the chain length gets longer and longer and longer. And then in the final one, I have paraffin wax, right? This like chunk of paraffin wax. And then I have the formula on there. And what's amazing about that station is 
These are all non-metal compounds, right? They're all covalent. This one's a gas and this one's a solid. Like what's happening, right? And then we look at, well, it's the size of the molecule. And so what? Why does the size of the molecule matter? And that is a great entryway for us right into intermolecular forces, right? And, and the size of the molecule has everything to do with the amount of IMF um, interaction that it has with other molecules, right? And even though they are all only London dispersion forces, the amount of London in paraffin wax is way, way, way larger than it is for methane. And thus, the molecules hang together more and it affects their state of matter. And so that's like mind blowing. Uh, I've noticed for kids when we get to that point is when we make that connection with IMF and the connection of IMF to state of matter, it's a significant one. So highly recommend doing that one. I don't know why that station's not in here, but that's, it's a good one. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, uh, so here's our, here's kind of our takeaways after our station lab and our, our lessons um, from the patterns that we've noticed. The molecules of a substance interact to varying degrees of attraction. So some are more attracted to each other than others. The more polar a molecule's bonds are, the more attractive molecules in a substance are to each other. Now, I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a statement right now, and it might be a little bit inflammatory, so bear with me. My opinion is that we don't really need, at this level, we don't really need to get into the whole molecular polarity. I know that's a very important concept in bio, um, but at this stage, at what we're doing right here, I think looking at the polarity of the molecule as a whole is a little distracting. And so what I focus on is just individual bond, because often what we're looking at are pretty complex molecules, right? It's not so easy as this vector cancels this vector out, right? We're, we're looking at fairly complex molecules. So I'm looking at how polar is this bond? And how polar is this bond, et cetera? Oh, I noticed that this molecule has a couple of polar bonds and they're all kind of on this end of the molecule. That's kind of the extent that we get to it. So we look at the more polar a molecule's bonds are, the more attractive they tend to be to each other. How do we know that? Well, we had more drops on a penny than this other substance, which doesn't have any polar bonds. Right. We're kind of using that evidence to get there. Now, some people feel really tied to determining the polarity of a molecule. And you'll notice that we saw some slides about that and they spend time on that. I think that's awesome. I for myself, I've noticed it's a little bit of a distraction for students and it gets away from what I want them to focus on, which is the polar parts of a large molecule attracting each other. Right. That kind of gets at why how is soap useful? right? Um, we're thinking about connecting it big picture. So that's, that's what I tend to focus on. We also look at for similar size molecules, we see that hydrogen bonding is, um, is more of a attractive force than dipole-dipole, which is more than London dispersion. And again, we're going back to our evidence from our lab. How do we know that? How did we see that? Um, we saw that in uh, in like our drops on a penny, for example. And then finally, from the structural formula, we can make predictions about the type and relative strength of the intermolecular forces between the molecules. So on the test, I'm going to give them some structures and I'm going to say who's going to be connected, like who who's going to have a stronger IMF connection with other other molecules of the same type. Right. So what I'm asking them to look at for there are, do, does it have polar bonds? Where are the polar bonds? How many polar bonds? And again, it's we're not it's not really a simple molecule, right? It's a it's a larger, more complex molecule. So that's why that's why I feel better about just focusing on just individual bonds. All right. So that's test set five. How's our time? Uh, good. Okay. Great. All right, so now we're getting into the engineering project. Um, and here they are all again, right? So you started the unit 
um, picking one and introducing that. And as you've been going through the unit, hopefully you've been kind of coming back to the driving question board and looking at like, oh, well, we can answer this question now. We know all about covalent bonding, right? Um, or, you know, we, we know this one, or I wonder what we meant by this question. I wonder if we could, I wonder if we could say it a little bit differently, right? And that's our opportunity to kind of reframe questions, rethink about them. Um, all right. Um, so I'm just highlighting Candy because that's the most recent one that I did. Um, Candy, like I said, it's it's uh, it's a t it's a time commitment. It's it's a commitment to do Candy because it it takes I think it takes more time and it, you also need all this kind of special food grade equipment. If you, if you're gonna let the kids eat it, it's got to be food grade um, glassware and, and such. Um, so each group is assigned a variable to test. So the variables are the amount of fat, what kind of emulsifier it is, what's the cooking temperature and the pH. So each group is, is changing their variable. So they're going to do the, um, they're going to make, I believe it's like three recipes. Yes. Oh. And if mine is amount of fat, I'm in my three recipes, I'm going to have a different amount of fat in each of those three recipes. And my whole job is to collect information, analyze my three recipes, and then come up with a recommendation that I'm going to share to the rest of the class. Like we really got our best results with the least amount of fat. So if I were making a recipe myself, which the groups are going to be doing, I would select the least amount of fat. And here's my evidence to support that. Right. So they're doing like a, a mini CER that they're then sharing out to the rest of the class. And then the rest of the class is using their evidence to build their new recipe. Right. So it's a little bit of a high stakes thing. There's a little bit of social pressure there to um, I, I want to get good results because people want to make a good recipe and they want to eat it. Right. So I, I I need to pay attention to what I'm doing. Um, okay, then groups make three recipes that vary in their assigned independent variable. They evaluate the results and share it class-wide. And with all of the class data, each group creates a new recipe considering all four variables. They make it, and then they evaluate it. Finally, each student develops either an ad for their candy or a series of slides that showcases a candy from their culture. So I put a couple of examples on here. I had... I was not expecting to have the number of students choose the cultural example as I got turned in and they were amazing. All of them were, they're so good. And I just really, um, I made a super big deal out of that when we looked at, um, when we kind of shared the, the, the products that we created. Um, we looked at all of the cultural candies and talked about all of them. Uh, I asked the students to chime in, like, what else? Did you tell us something about your trip when you went to France and you tried this, you know, tell us some kind of anecdote. We we committed class time to doing this because I felt like there was so much value in sharing those experiences. So I just wanted to put a couple of examples here. Of course, I took student names off of this, but you can see... Um, kind of what, and I gave them a, a template. I gave them an example so they could see what, what I was looking for. Um, but then they kind of go through and they talk about the temperature and how it's made and their sources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the ads, um, a bunch of students made ads uh, and they were hilarious. Um, I gave them a structure for what I wanted to have included, but then I also said, have fun with it too. Like, um, I want you to get some, um, some feedback about your candy. Um, just like someone who is marketing a new product would get feedback from citizens and then report out on that feedback. Nine out of 10 consumers say, you know, blah, blah, blah. That kind of feedback, you want to include that in your, in your ad. So then... <laughs> Students just had a good time with that, and I'll show you those in a, in a second. So here we are making the candy. Um, so trying to keep, before students came in, I did a really deep clean of these tables. And then even after that, I had them keep everything that touches a food-related thing needs to be kept on a 
uh, like I don't want you laying these things on the countertop. Sometimes teachers use a food safe bucket and all the materials are just staying in the bucket or they're getting, you know, heated. They're not ever just sitting on, on the countertop. Um, here is another group. They are working on their candy. You can see one of our, one of our um, flavor supplements there. And then here's where we're writing our mini CER. Uh, and you'll notice it's not in paragraph form, right? They're making their claim what they think is the best amount of fat. For example, this group has fat. So what's the best amount of fat? What's the evidence? And how does that evidence tell you that that's the best amount, right? Literally a CER, we're just kind of bulleting it out instead of writing it out in long form, because then groups are going to read all of this and they're going to decide, okay, how much fat are we going to put in our recipe? Um, Notice both of these groups right here, both had fat. They may come to a different claim, which is okay. We just have to make sure we're reading carefully the evidence and the reasoning to try to figure out why, why are they getting different results. Then we have pH. Notice they're next to each other, pH and pH. Uh, temperatures down here, the two temperatures, et cetera. So, um, there's, I think there's a lot of different models you could do here. You could do a more traditional board meeting um, and have your whiteboards. You could do it digitally. There's lots of different options here. Um, this one worked particularly well, I thought, because then the students had to kind of back it up and, and not only did they write it, but then they had to talk about it. Like, why does this, why does this evidence mean this fat is the best amount? Um, here's some ads that we got here, like, uh, where is the candy we can guarantee you will only have once, right? Like some of the recipes did not turn out very well. And then students just really had fun with that. Quotes from customers, um, the process, reviews, here's the recipe we use, lots of pictures. I said you did have lots of pictures in there. Um, pros and cons, et cetera. Um, some quotes from other students, so lots of good stuff here. So this was a really a nice way. Um, this was again, an end of semester. We always get to a chemical bonding right before the end of the semester. So uh, this was a nice like way to kind of wrap up the semester in terms of our lab work. Here's another one, 99% um, off. Um, well, it looked pretty. Uh, well, this is why you should not buy this candy. So they were not fans of this one, um, et cetera. So <laughs> Ms. Miller's class where students are not responsible for any injuries, death, and our mishaps. Oh, wow. We have terms of use. We have, we have it all there. I love it. Okay. Um, here, they're kind of analyzing what happened. It's supposed to be like this. Here's why we think it's not like that, et cetera. Um, certain ingredients are added to perform specific functions, taste, consistency, texture, smoothness. And being able to, you know, a recipe is a complicated thing. So being able to make some connections as to potentially why something happened, we don't 100% know why. Um, I think we, you know, we do a little bit of light error analysis with this too, and try to come to some conclusions about, well, how was our measuring skills for all the other ingredients, right? Are, do you feel really confident that truly the only thing you varied was the fat, right? Like, you know, it just, it kind of begs some, some additional questions too. And I like to try to work in an error analysis as often as possible. I think that's such a valuable skill for students to have to think about like, hmm, this didn't turn out the way we wanted it to. What could be influencing that? Um, all right. So that was six. And then the last one here is about the assessment. Um, if you've attended other webinars, you've probably heard us talk about um, alternate ways of doing assessments. So we have, I have a template here for whiteboard presentation, um, a collection of evidence. Um, here's an example of that. Oh, nope, sorry, that's an actual test. Let's try, uh, here's, a, here's an example of a collection of evidence. 
So when I created the slide deck, I had some things in here that were must haves. So there's a sequencing thing here. There's a, a three column. There's a note paper. Like these are the things I for sure want you to do, but you can add other slides as well. So this student added quite a quite a bunch of other slides. And what they're doing is they're taking the work that we've already done in this unit, and they are showing their understanding of these concepts by annotating um, or summarizing or taking some of that work that they already did. This is from the um, Jamboard, and they're explaining what this means, right? So again, it's we've already done this work. It's not additional things I'm asking them to do. It's like, go pull from the things that you already did and show me that you understand what ionic bonding is. So I'm just using this picture that I have already created someplace else, and I'm explaining what this means. And then on the template, I've got a list of things that I need them to show me an understanding of. So it's it's very prescribed. Um, this one gives them a little bit of agency for how they want to show what they know. And it gives them a little um, time pressure uh, relief, right? It's not like we're all going to sit down and take this next paper test for 90 minutes, right? They have days to work on this, right? So that's very relieving for some students. Um, I have found that having options is... Um, it's been a game changer for me in terms of assessment to really have kids be able to um, show what they know and can do in uh, in a way that's their choice. That's been that's been a really um, kind of a mindful way that I've changed my practice because I've seen such uh, significant results from that in terms of student. Um, calm student um, engagement in the process. I still, I have some student diehards that are like, oh, nope, I just really love a good old fashioned test, right? So then we have one of those too. So we're naming and writing formulas. We have some experimental data. This is like from the intermolecular lab. So I've got some information from different stations, but I don't know what the substances are. And so I have to make some claims about their IMF strength just based on the on the data itself. And now I've got some information on the structures, what's the dominant IMF, um, and then making a connection between A, B, C, and D, and these four right here. Who is A, who is B, who is C, and who is D? How did you arrive at that? Here's some more data from a station. How am I going to rank those in terms of intermolecular force? Boiling point, give me a prediction about boiling point based on the structure. Um, and then got some, let's see, Lewis dot, oh yes, Lewis dot structure. Here's some, here's some constraints for your Lewis dot structure. Come up, come up with a molecule that works, is a viable structure, but but holds this constraint right here. Sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, holds this constraint right here outlined in A. And then give me another molecule that is viable that holds this constraint for B. So um, not making a claim that this is by any means the best 3D assessment. That's one area that we're still working on in our council is really trying to frame our assessments um, with a 3D lens. Um, and we've done that pretty well for certainly for units one and two, but um, we need to, you know, it's a work in progress. We keep looking, keep making it better all the time. Um, we also have a test bank of there's tons of questions in here that we just pulled from a range of um, people's practices. And then we group them by, um, you know, entry level. So this is like a level three type question when I'm thinking proficient and I'm thinking of my district scale, four, three, two, one, a three is proficient. So these are what kids should be able to answer if they're feeling on target, right? That they're meeting the target. They should be able to answer these questions. We've got some HPs down here. 
um, these will challenge them a little bit because maybe there's scenarios that we haven't quite seen before. So I have to take the evidence that I have from my learning and I have to apply it to a situation that's more complex or maybe one I haven't seen. So there's a bunch of stuff here in this um, test bank um, you can go in and pull from and, and make your own make your own assessment. Um, so that brings me kind of to the end of the of the unit four part of it. And I'm, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about some PMSP stuff. But I just wanted to stop and pause here and see if there's any questions. Um, I'm also going to go back while you're thinking of your question. I'm going to go back here. I don't see any in the parking lot. That means I answered everything, right? <laughs> No, I'm sure you must have some lingering questions. What can I answer for you? Nothing. Okay. All right, I'm just going to scroll through my thing here. Nope. All right. If you don't do candy, how do you do the other options? Um, well, that's a great question. There are, so when I'm thinking about my other options here, let me just escape, that'll be much quicker. When I'm thinking about my other options, it, you know, again, it kind of depends on what you have the time and the resources to do. Um, so I would say candy usually takes the longest. Um, lip balm can be um, long or short, depending on kind of how you, what your time is. And I think the other ones are all kind of in between candy and lip balm in terms of length. Um, this one only needs about five or so different shampoos from the store. The rest of the equipment is like graduated cylinders and probably things that you already have. Candy requires the most equipment. Um, stain engineering should really be uh, basic stuff in your lab already. Um, this one does need some specialty equipment or not equipment, but like um, I'm blanking on the name right now. Um, we had to order from Amazon. It was, it was not inexpensive, I would say, but it was not as expensive as candy just because of the number of things that candy required. Um, if you don't have any of the supplies, like, um, there is a list of supplies, um, the supplies that would be listed, and those are those are going to be on the kind of the general, if you go into the chemistry folder, it wouldn't be in any one unit, it would just, it would be like a general, um, a general list and it should apply for all of the, um, like for a year's worth of chemistry, these are the things that you need, ideally. Um, if you don't have, you know, beakers and um, uh, graduated cylinders and things like that, you could still do shampoo engineering um, just with, you know, if you can find some kind of containers where you students can mark on them how much foaming um, a shampoo is having. Um, that was kind of the point of using the graduated cylinders because then we can measure it, but they can mark on it and measure it that way. Um, probably, I would say shampoo is probably the least impactful in terms of supplies needed, um, maybe followed by stain remover. This one, you need some specific supplies that can be kind of expensive. This one, you need a lot of supplies. This one has that really strong base in it, but otherwise it's just kind of some general chemistry things. And then this one, of course, this might be a good option if you if you just do not have a um, stocked lab because you, you can get oil and mustard and vinegar from the store. You can go to the dollar store and get, you know, a dollar of vinegar 
and the containers like this big and that's going to work for several people right because you don't need a lot you don't need to make a lot so salad dressing is probably even um less impactful in terms of equipment and resources than even shampoo so um that's kind of how i would rank them i'm thinking about what materials do i have do i have money to spend um how much time is the salad dressing lab posted? It is posted in the um, online resources. So we developed that during CDL. So it's not the in-person. It might be linked on the in-person teacher notes. I think it is actually linked on the in-person teacher notes, but it's definitely linked on the um, uh, the I forget what it's called, like the the CDL unit plan, the um, digital resources. And is there a workup on how they do the different ones? Yes, each of these engineering projects has its own set of teacher notes that walks and slideshow and walks you through um, how to do each one. So yes, it, in detail, each one is included. Yep, perfect. Yay. All right. Oh, well, that Chris, didn't work. Can, yep. can I ask a question out loud? Yeah, of course. Please um, I don't know how to how to ask this well, so I'm just gonna do it out loud. Um, it. it seems it seems like the chemist the chemistry behind the candy engineering comes down to like about balancing the emulsifier. Is that kind of accurate? It is, but it's also I mean, if you add too much citric acid, the the candy's not gonna be edible, right? Because it's gonna be too tart. So there's a pH okay. piece also, um, right. and then the the temperature that you cook it at gives um, an indication of the texture of the candy. Is it going to be a very hard candy or is it going to be a soft candy? They all play a factor in, in different ways. Okay. Um, yeah. What do the other projects, what is the chemistry of the other projects kind of come down to? Like, are they all kind of emulsifier based or like you know, the they, texture leads to, or the temperature leads to texture based, or do they all have something unique? They, I think they all have something unique and they all have common commonalities. So um, there is an emulsifier piece definitely in the salad dressing. That's, you know, one of the more highlighted pieces, I would say. Um, and then soap and to some extent lip balm and shampoo all have a, um, uh, you know, a, a soap, a micelle, a water, polar, nonpolar component to them. So those all have that kind of overlapping in each one. Um, the lip balm does as well because we talk about it as a barrier for, to moisture. So we look at polar and nonpolar with that respect also. So they do all have some overlap. Um, I would say the emulsifier probably shows up most in candy and in salad dressing, though. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Of course, Megan. Um, I came late. Is there a link for attendance? There is. If you have the slides that it's on number two, the link is right here. And here is the slides link just in case great what else other questions let's see there's a couple i was going to look at down here with you just really briefly um here um so we have uh, a couple of upcoming things upcoming webinars one is our continuing plc on grading for equity andrea and i work on that um, that is a subject very near and dear to our hearts. Um, uh, we are doing this year, we are doing um, uh, the PLC is over the whole year. It's from September to June. And each topic, um, we spend two months on each topic. So right now we're looking at rubrics and we're just going to be next week finishing our second um our second session on rubrics um, and then we'll be going into student engagement so like every two months we have a new topic that we do a deep dive on 
um, you can register here at this link. The next one is next week in December, and then there's another one in January. There is a link for past recorded webinars. Um, it's on the PMSP YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and then um, search for PMSP webinars or something, you'll a whole bunch of them will come up and there's playlists, there's different playlists, there's one for chemistry and one for physics, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all loaded there. Um, you're welcome. Finally, we have um, we have a bio unit four webinar that's coming up at the beginning of January. Those are the next two um, most recent next ones that are coming up. We're just getting ready to um, secure some dates for our next series, which will be our unit five, six and seven webinars, which will carry us through the spring. Um, we don't have dates for those yet, but um, we'll be securing those. And then the next newsletter is going to come out shortly, and I'll have all the dates on there and all the links, and et cetera, et cetera. So thank you all for coming today and um, engaging and asking great questions. Again, this unit is so wonderful. I love everything about it. Not biased at all. Um, there's just a lot of great hands-on stuff, and kids, just they just dig it. They just do. It, there's so much to do and think about, and um, it's great fun. It's a good way to round out the semester, I would say. So thank you all again for coming. If you want to stick around for a few minutes, I'm just going to stop recording. Otherwise, have a wonderful winter break um, if I don't see you, and um, hope to see you again real soon. Hey, Christy. I um, I had a question. I was looking through my notes. What could I ask her? But um you had brought up the your favorite station, the States of Matter station for yes. class at five. I just yes. went back and looked at the the slides that are we have on the shared drive and I couldn't find anything like you mentioned. Okay. Is there a way like our team is so curious and so chem nerdy that we would love to see that if you find. Oh, that. yeah. Yeah. It might be in my own. Um, Sometimes I take the lab and I will, you know, tweak it just a little bit and it might just be in my own version, but I'm so happy to share that or even link it on the teacher notes if other people want to take a look at it too. So I'm just making a note to myself, States of Matter Station, um, IMF Lab. Yep. Thank you. I, and yes. then I just wanted to say, I appreciate so much when you were talking through the materials as someone who has only taught chem once and 10 years ago. Going yeah. through all these materials is really um, a learning curve for me to support. Sure. So like your poo pack. <laughs> <laughs> or like you're like, you're like, take the bean hack. like those are yeah. so all cool, those little things awesome. that are have yeah. uh, baby chemists like me. So I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for saying so. Yeah. Like don't buy butyric acid, right? Just go down and get the uh, snake poop. So yep. I, yeah, I second you. that. I, I second that because I always get I'll get overwhelmed with the materialist being oh, like yeah. I'm never going to be able to get my hands huh. on that so nope. then I just throw the baby out with the bath water and I don't yeah. do anything dang so I'm, I'm glad you shared that good good thank you thank you for that all right well I'm going to take off have a good night thank you good to see you Jeff see you great Yay. I want to say thank you. And I, I'm going to sign off. I got to get my kids fed. So um, Absolutely. thank you for everything. Yeah, of course. Really Thanks for coming. It. Thanks for coming, Valerie. Bye. Bye. Hi, Laura. Laura. Oh, are you there? Nope, not there. Okay. I'm going to leave, Laura. I'll see you later. <laughs>